So I've come to Chiswick in London to see Matt Smith who is a photographer but he's taken on a bit of a building project here with this lovely old house. So let's go and have a chat with him. This was a house that we were very lucky to have been gifted because my grandfather bought it in the 1930s. We're kind of honoured to be able to renovate it. We've doubled the floor space from something like 95 square metres to 200 square metres by putting basements out the back and out the front and also a decent sized kitchen out the back as well. The idea is this is going to be our forever home so um, yeah. I'm personally very invested in it. Um, we've had to often undo the mess that that our contractors have made. It's quite quite a grand scale, actually. Ten years ago, I couldn't put up a shelf. Now I can lay a concrete <laughs> really? slab. Yeah, Blimey, I, I, you've I really loads, couldn't. Haven't you? I'd have to call my dad. You know, how do I do this? Uh, but now I can put a lay a concrete slab with reinforcements, um, suspended staircase in concrete. You know, get an expert at reading um, the. Uh, building regs, um, uh, yeah, wiring regs, the whole, the whole lot. We've got a really good kitchen company um, who are designing this lovely kind of bar. I love cocktails, so I'm gonna, that's, <laughs> that's my, my ideal kind of like 1940s house would be you walk in and there's a bar. We've got a little uh, bathroom here, a bath on the right, a uh, sink in the middle with these beautiful kind of LED um, surrounds to this mirror and then toilet and whatnot on the left. This room, which is yeah, it's still part of the original building, is gonna be a uh, front bedroom. Sash windows overlooking the high road. It's a bit noisy, to be honest. We need to put some, um, perhaps put some secondary glazing or something like that in there. And we're actually very lucky because, um, to, you know, to get a consent for this project, but um, we, we put a really good application together and we're able to show that we would care more about this building than any developer yeah, coming along yeah, ever would. Okay, and that yeah. we would treat every little design decision with, you know, sympathy um, to the old old building. Um, so you sold yourself to them, basically, David. Basically, but you? I mean, they they have no idea how much extra we've done them. We've sold to them, actually. You know, repointing all of the walls in the in the lower ground floor in lime, for example, was um, a bit of a mammoth job. Um, but when we got to those walls, they'd been covered up by plaster, um, you know, cement-based plaster. So they were well, they were a bit kind of soaking wet inside. Mm -hmm. um, so we stripped all of that off and then that found right. kind of not particularly dry bricks. So what we wanted to do was just to give the building a new lease of life, another 50, 100 years with pointing it, and we're not gonna cover them up again. Well, we're waterproofing them with this kind of cavity, cavity drain membrane that we're putting on top. Yeah, yeah. But we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna tank them like a lot of people would do. Um, these stairs are here temporarily, but actually the stairs will be coming down in the middle. Anna really wants the, some kind of lovely curved sweeping staircase and I've told her I haven't managed to do curved wooden structures yet. Well, Perhaps it's the thing option. is you can get those made in a joiner shop, can't you? So, yeah. and the guys that come along, I mean, I've got a property developer I know and he he gets some guys in Wales to do it. And honestly, yeah. in Oak, and they're pretty cheap. Yeah. They come and put the whole thing in. Oh. They've built it, they install it, and when he tells me the price that he pays, I can't believe it, so. Right, okay, well, they're, they're living off Welsh development grants, those yeah. guys. So here we're on a suspended concrete slab um, because there's a basement underneath. Oh, okay. Um, well, obviously we're on screed at the moment, but there's mm. screed, then a sacrificial insulation under there, um, which we need to bring the level up so it matched the outside. Above we've got this, um, I mean, architects, uh, they're, they're great sometimes, but they're, they're <laughs> absolute, they're an absolute nightmare sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Some of the design decisions that our architect made are very, very pretty, but they have been a real difficulty to actually yeah. put into, into practice. Yeah. So this is a cantilever roof. The idea with this is that it was going to be a floating roof. So from outside, you would see this kind of, this floating roof which juts out beyond the end, and you'd see kind of glass around it, and that gives it the floating kind of look. Got it. Um, so it's just kind of held up by nothing. In actual fact, it's held up by this. So this steel over the top cantilevers on this one in that direction and um, it's held up in that corner by a steel there as well. And those are the only two steels it's held up by, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. But it's actually also held down by a steel on that wall, but oh, anyway, okay. I won't go into yeah, yeah. much more detail there. Yeah, um, we're going to have a kitchen island in here. Yeah, so this winder staircase, um, I mean, everyone's probably built a winder staircase, but a non-carpenter trying to have a go at it. People don't it? build staircases anymore. They just get the joiner shop to do it and they just assemble them. So yeah. there's a lot of people wouldn't even know where to start. Carpenters I'm talking about. So. Right, so so with this, it's I've built everything in um, structural timber underneath and then 25 mil plywood on top. And we're gonna obviously put, put finishes on it afterwards. And um, the idea is that it forms part of a room underneath. 
um, which is more than a cupboard under the stairs. It's kind of our plant room, I call it. Um, the winder took me, a non-carpenter, a very long time to do because I had to grapple with the building um, building regulations part H um, over and over and over again until I got it right. But they're very exacting, aren't they? The, the, the regulations, they want a margin, you know, the, yeah, so you can't bring that down to a fine point. You see exactly, loads of staircases yeah, so, brought down like that. Yeah, so, so your um, your point that your winder goes to has to be a minimum of 50 millimetres yeah. here. So obviously, so when you're coming down in a rush, like, sure. you know, you had yeah, you perhaps can't fall off the one, edge, yeah, one yeah. too many whiskies or whatever. Yeah, many have died. Trying to do the maths for this is, is quite difficult, but the going of this, which let's say it's 220 mil. Yeah. If you were to draw an arc from the middle of here, which might be one width, and this might be a different width, if you were to draw a perfect arc, the yeah. goings of each of these sections has to be the exact same as the going of that. And that is actually pretty hard to, to, to work yeah. out. Yeah. That's some quite hardcore maths. In the end, I didn't work it out from maths. I, I worked it out from trial and error and just kind of adjusting the numbers on a bit of paper until got yeah. I got them exactly the same and I did it all in 3D um, in SketchUp. So that's the staircase, took me three goes um, but it is uh, more solid than you can imagine so we've... Yeah. No creaks in it, I know that. Absolutely no creaks. <laughs> Every time you build a basement you've got to bear in mind that water comes through the concrete walls. There's soil behind those walls and every section of wall is just kind of joined up by just adding more concrete. So water can get through those gaps, yeah, um, the, these construction gaps, and that water over time filters through and um, that water's got to go somewhere. So you can see water's got to come down the walls and then it kind of goes along the floor. And there's so you've actually- you got the same membrane under the floor, a different one, but it's yeah, the Yeah, it's same a different one. It's a, it's a 20 mil, yeah. um, a 20 mil membrane under the floor. And actually we've also got these perimeter drains that go around the outside as well so that you can maintain it, you can you know, flush them out and whatnot. And then the water eventually come, comes to the middle here into this sump. You get two pumps when you buy one of these systems. Pumps are very high spec and they're very good. And obviously when the lever goes, it pumps the water out. Let's say you aren't able to come home for whatever reason and those, the electrics go or something like that. The water's coming up and up and up and up because there's a flood. And then these two things aren't working. Let's say one broken, you didn't notice it and the other one is now broken. You would have this thing called a float switch, which when the water comes up, it would set off the float switch and then you'd hear an alarm and that alarm has to have a battery backup and all of that kind of stuff. I don't think these systems are actually fantastic, but these are required by the building race. But if your, um, if your float switch were to break or something like that, and of course, this float switch is never gonna engage except for 15 years down the line. Got it, so, and so you're never alarm, gonna know. This is the alarm float switch we're talking about rather than yeah. the one that's been exactly. in and out. So yeah. it's, it's sat there for 15 years and sees solid, say. Absolutely, you'd never know if it works or yeah. not, unless, well, yeah. you have to test yeah. it, you should test it, but this is called an ultrasonic distance sensor, but it just goes down to the bottom and it points this sensor down to the bottom. It senses how far away the surface of the water is as it fills up that little pipe. And what this does is every two seconds, it will ping a message to my server. It will tell me what the level of the water is. So not only do I get notifications when it becomes disconnected, if there's some problem, rather than what you'd have with a float switch, which you just never know, but also I'm able to actually trace the, the level of the water in there um, you might think this is a bit pointless. I mean, I'm a tinkerer, so I enjoy looking at all the graphs. Um, and, but I also enjoy seeing what effect um, the water and the rainfall has on how often this thing goes off. So uh, yeah, that's my little, one of my little projects <laughs> I've done there. These steels, unfortunately, shouldn't be here, but the reason that they're there is because the uh, basement company who came and um, dug this basement and put the suspended slab, this is concrete slab on top, um, they didn't put the correct reinforcements in. And at this time, this was only shortly after I couldn't put up a shelf, and um, I didn't know how to read structural engineers' diagrams at all. I just trusted that they were gonna do it correctly, and it was a big mistake doing that, I'll tell you what. My biggest piece of advice that I would give myself then would be, if you wanna switch off to the detail, just don't. Just, just, just spend the extra mental effort in understanding the diagrams and making sure that it happens, because we've had guys come in, this is the basement company, who put their sewage pipe in with a fall the wrong way yeah, yeah. Back, back into the back house fall, yeah, yeah. and actually there was some really bad conduct Anna came along with a with spirit level and said the fall's going the wrong way mate and um, one of them lost it chucked a hammer down and it, <sighs> it, it went up and hit her head oh, no. thankfully not the metal bit but they were sent off site that day but yeah. these are the kinds of you know so issues just by you're saying to a guy you've got the fall going the wrong way yeah, he actually, throws his toys out of breath. Actually, one, the one yeah. guy who we were addressing, he was all right and he was a, yeah. he's a nice enough yeah. guy. It was the other guy who'd spent a bit of time doing yeah. something. And, and none of them are plumbers. None of them, they're just, they're, yeah. they're just guys who Groundworkers, use, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. buckets and yeah, 
wheelbarrows and whatnot. So we've had to keep our eye on absolutely everything, um, but unfortunately this slab did develop some um, signs of structural issues. So a suspended concrete slab, you don't want to see cracks in that. You can see cracks in walls because you get a bit of subsidence and, and you expect that a little bit, but in a suspended concrete slab, you don't want to see a crack. And what we saw were cracks um, that were kind of um, heading towards a point load, which is there's a steel, um, which is upstairs that was that, that point load. And um, we were scabbling off the concrete down here one day because the, uh, another story, but the, the concrete that they'd laid had a 70 mil variance in height. Can you believe it? I mean, you can't waterproof that. So we had to scabble that all off and we did a nice bonded screed when it was all cleaned off. It took weeks and weeks to do this. Um, it's beautiful and flat now. But whilst we were doing that, I looked up and I saw these, um, uh, I saw these cracks and I thought, that's not, you shouldn't really have that in a suspended slab. And so, we went back and we got some advice from a concrete expert and he said show me the photos of, of you know when they laid it he said you've got no reinforcement in your concrete like you like you should have on the structural diagrams and i said what do you mean there's loads of metal all over it there's all this mesh stuff two layers of mesh that's got to be good enough and he said mesh isn't the same as reinforcement mesh mesh and reinforcement are two different things yeah they're metal bars mesh is you know the crisscross metal bar but that's not um you, you know that's for localized uh, uh, to avoid localised um, curvature yeah. but reinforcement is something that is different and we're expecting 12mm bars to go in um, to stop it bending to stop basically. it bending yeah. over this wall yeah. um, and they should have come out from the edges um, that, that didn't go in at all so we had to retrofit these steels which is um, you know another. how the hell did you get those steels down here? thankfully um, we got a steel guy who wasn't the, the same as the guys who did the original job and um, they spec'd it out and did a, a really lovely job and we had to cut the holes out um, there and then we actually um, on this side I believe we put a, a kind of a plate uh, what do you call it a bracket um, with big M12 or M16 actually Got bolts yeah, yeah. resin fixed into the wall there and of course we had to waterproof around everything so um, because the, these are all potential places where yeah, the uh, yeah. water could yeah, get you in. leave one tiny little bit and that's yeah. the bit isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's why we've got this slightly annoying structure. This would have been beautiful had it been, you know, a, a proper suspended slab. Yeah. Um, we didn't make that mistake in the front basement. Actually, the guys who dug our basements block and beamed the front. They didn't even put a, a suspended slab in there. They block and beamed it, and then they put concrete on top, which looks great from outside, but um, the thing with block and beam is, I'm sure loads of people bounces. will disagree, it bounces. I'm sure a load of people see, will say, oh no, it's absolutely fine block and beaming, yeah. you're, you're sorted, just use the, you know, the, the heavyweight blocks and you'll be fine. We live on a high road with four lanes of traffic and buses going past yeah. you know, all yeah, times yeah, of day yeah, and night. Yeah. They do bounce a building, I know that. Yeah, they bounce and the thing is, waterproofing for, for a basement, you really want to make sure the movement is minimised on your, on your you know, concrete structure. So that's so. When we go into the front basement, I'll show you. Um, we don't have any of this rubbish because we actually redid the roof from scratch ourselves. This is our server room. We've got a. What are you doing? Mining Bitcoin. With this? Uh, we're actually not mining Bitcoin. <laughs> I run my own kind of home automation um, YouTube channel because um, yeah. I love home automation and I build kind of products from scratch, and that's what I love to do the most. So building regulations does require that you actually have a physical alarm. So that's why I've made this little thing um, from scratch. I've 3D printed the case for it and I've, oh, I've made it out of an Arduino, which I can show you inside if you're really that interested. Wow. This is my little board, which I've designed. The ticks mean that the system, the monitoring system is operational. Um, and if you were to disconnect one, it would start beeping and it would give you a cross. The millimetre reading is the actual distance from the sensor to the water surface. Cool. And what I've done is I've converted that into a percentage full um, you, just, just by calibrating it. It also, the building rates require you have a test button. So I can press the test button. Oh, okay. And it does test it. When the alarms go off, you can press the silence button as well. It says shh there. Um, <laughs> and that lasts for 30 seconds, but it will come back on again. And you can actually arm or disarm the alarm for each one of these. So that's pumping it um, out, which uh, in this case is unfortunately above the level of the floor. Otherwise you could just okay. presumably let gravity yeah, do its yeah, job. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and there's, a, there's an iPhone app and, and all that kind of stuff for, for this system as well. Right. And actually what I can do is I well, can get- your iPhone app, yeah. you made the iPhone fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the other kind of benefit of that is that if I'm away, if there's 
um, some kind of other waterproofing issue, and there have been, thanks to Thames Water, uh, completely not of our own making, but the fact that the sewers are, are not built to the correct capacity. If there are other waterproofing issues, if these pumps just go over and over and over again, because they're trying to pump out and they can't because there's too much pressure oh, on the okay, system, yeah, yeah. I can be notified that the pump has run more than three times in five minutes, for example, yeah. and I get a little message on my phone saying, you know, there's a likely flood. Um, I've had to deal with floods. So you tell Thames Water? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not very responsive, to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've had that situation too many times, unfortunately, now. But we've we've built other ways of mitigating that as well, which I can show you if you're right. interested. This, I can't help but admire your bit of plumbing here as well. Yeah, the plumbing um, is very much Joe's baby. He's he's done a beautiful job. Joe's our, our, um, our, our guy who's gone off to do bigger and better things now. The young lad, you you're the young lad, about. yeah. Oh, right, okay. I think he was 20 when he when he put all this together. We've got a secondary return, and we've got everything's automatable again from from an iPhone app. You can turn on and off the secondary return. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got um, sensors around the house so that it'll know when someone's in, and it'll turn the secondary return off when no one's in, so it doesn't got waste it. energy. Yeah, so it's not pumping around doing that. Exactly. Yeah. Joe, bless him, has learned pretty much everything he knows from watching uh, Roger Bisbee videos. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> I, he, he looks like he's better than me, actually. He's, I've got to say, you know. He's put um, valves literally everywhere. Everything's beautifully labelled. Yeah. Um, so that if you needed to um, disconnect anything, it would be easy to do that. If I go into a house, it may sometimes take me half an hour, work out the system, work out where all the valves are, what turns off what, you know, where everything goes. And of course the customer's paying for that. Yeah. Whereas if you've got it labelled up, you go straight in and say, okay, this is a secondary return, you know, isolation, whatever it is, yeah. you know straight away. So that can save a lot of money. I think it's a service that people ought to provide really, you know, when they install a system, just go around and label everything in the house. Yeah. We've got a lovely Wiesman boiler there. I I can't remember off the top of my head the model, it was the, the, the yeah. highest M1, it was a yeah. 200 I think. Pretty nice. Um, it's got an excellent modulation ratio so that it's um, really an energy efficient. And then we're using heat miser for all of our thermostats. We've got 10 zones of underfloor, plus we've got some more pumps down there. We've even got the ability to turn on your water mains and turn it off from here. So if oh, there's yeah, a leak, yeah. I know those, yeah. so we've got leak sensors um, going in in a lot of places. And if there's a leak, um, say a bathroom, I don't know, you know those yeah. little um, braided, um, yeah, braiding yeah, things yeah. that connect to your tap, sometimes they just kind of blow. Okay. And if you've got a leak, we'll have a leak sensor under baths and under kitchen cabinets. And um, this, this server down here is monitoring everything. And so we've got the ability to just literally just turn the incoming water supply off um, for emergency situations. It's got a manual override as well. So this is the control panel um, that I've got on my laptop for um, that, that box. Um, and you can see we've got the three buttons to arm the alarms for each of those three sumps. Um, here, which I can do, and that will be reflected on, on the sump controller unit. Um, that tells us the percentage full there as well, so I can actually access all that information here. Um, here's my water supply monitor. And so we've actually got three water supplies coming into the building because just the history of the building, <laughs> uh, I don't know why. And I've got leak detections and I've got the ability to kind of ignore leaks. So for that's for testing reasons. And what it will do is it literally turns the water supply off if there's a, if there's a big old leak. Because we've had leaks before and they've ruined newly painted things that we've done in the house before. Yeah. So this is the, the, the kind of the graph of the, of the sumps. So here I've got the last 30 minutes selected. So this green one is the one that we looked at and you can see it dropped down because I kind of fiddled with the little yeah, hole. I saw it. Yeah, um, yeah. But if I go to, you can zoom out to the last 90 days or 24 hours or seven days. If we go to seven days, the green one shows that the pump last kind of expunged on the 17th of November. And if I just bring in the rainfall for that time as well, you can see there's a bit of this pink one here is the rainfall. You see rain has come in and the water's gone up and up and up and up. It's hit the, uh, the, the moment where the water's too high for the actual pump's arm and that's gone off and it's kind of expunged and then starts filling back up immediately again. Of course you can zoom out to, not I've got 90 days, I've got about a year and a half worth of data here so I can go in and troubleshoot things as well. So this is a picture of Anna in our front basement, it's not a nice picture, <laughs> uh, but it shows you the kinds of things that we, this, we hadn't got any screed or insulation down, no electric, so at this point it was just the shell, so it was not a bad time to have the horrible yeah. sewage leak. The yeah. sewage leak came from um, Chiswick High Road, um, Thames Water, uh, when there's a flash flood, what happens is the sewers become so full that they start pushing back. At this point, we actually, our manhole hadn't been closed up because we were part way through doing the build. 
and we weren't expecting Sirius to come back out from the, from the road. You know, we put a, a double sealed manhole cover in and then the problem happened again because the, the liquid kind of came out much more slowly but through the tiny little holes in the manhole cover. We kind of went nuclear and built an enormous huge kind of concrete tub around the whole lot. Put a pump in there and now I've got the ability to pump out sewage if it comes back and there's a little periscope over our light well. I don't want my basement flooding. No, no, so, no. no that's um, what I was going to say. Where did you pump it to? But yeah. basically what you're saying is if their sewage is blocked up is the yeah that you're going to give it back to them yeah absolutely Whoa. i mean actually to be honest when the sewage comes back you don't get solids because the it's being filtered yeah. by these holes so it. so yeah. it's it's water yeah. but it, it you know it does prevent our basement waterproofing system from working because it's got, got, got nowhere to pump the water oh, so yeah, it's so the whole yeah, yeah. thing could flood um, yeah, even the back yeah. basement, so that's why we've I've kind of gone to town with it really. Yeah, yeah. Speaking to a lot of um, businesses and restaurants along the road, none of them have any of this. So, um, you know, we went to an Indian restaurant down the road um, about a year ago, and they said just after the floods hit them, we know the owners really well, and they said, yeah, they ruined twenty thousand pounds worth of refrigeration equipment. Um, and just there's no like compensation. That. Mains incoming monitoring as well, and a couple of um, actually two. We're monitoring two incomings and um, one kind of sub circuit. And so I can hit on the last 24 hours and you can see we spent £9.21 in 24 hours on one of our three. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite horrendous. In our case, unfortunately, this building has got a weird history, but some of it's commercial. Yeah. And therefore, um, the bits that we can't live in. And, and, and actually, the commercial costs went up from uh, 23 pence per kilowatt hour to 114. Can you believe it? Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, really. Goodness. And of course, we've got to keep it. There's a boiler on there, so we've got to keep the, the mains turned on yeah. um, because yeah. you can't let it freeze. Um, uh, but this is great because it really allows you to kind of zoom in on the facts and figures at a given point in time. So this is our third floor. This is our, our top flat. So we can see that the, um, the oven's been on this morning. And there's different kind of uh, peaks and, and troughs that, that tell you different things. This is the bit we don't talk about. Okay. <laughs> Look at the sheer yeah. amount of I mean, yeah, it's, it's well, all yeah. done. Uh, but you can see everything's labelled, um, you know, heat return, cold mains in, I've labelled, you know, condensed pump, foul yeah, pumps, yeah. sump pump, everything's labelled so you can get to it later. Uh, that's condensed pump for the boiler which is below the level of the sewage so we need to bring it up. Obviously that's got to be um, a metre above ground level for building regs because you can't just chuck it in at ground level. I've got these dust sheets up because I'm doing a lot of insulation cutting at the moment. Now I was umming and ahhing about whether we'd get spray foam insulation in the whole lot and in the end I just decided to cut it by hand. Uh, it's a bit of an effort because I've got 75 mil thickness insulation and they are, you know, treated timbers are never quite 75 mil. That's what all this gubbings is. It's me slicing the back off bits of insulation oh, okay, and, got and then it. reattaching uh... this with foam. Uh, it's a right old effort, but I kind of just put my headphones on and yeah. and my dust mask on well, and just went. go for it. And we're ply backing everything with a 12 mil ply. That's because I might one day want to come along and hang something really heavy sure, on here. Yeah. Sure, yeah. You you're not puncturing the membrane. Well, it's, it's a long way from the membrane. It's anyway. a long way from the membrane, but I know not to use anything more than a like 70, 70 mil screw in, in there. Everything, so I just photograph everything. So everything's documented like really? crazy. I know where every wire runs out the back of a... Um, out the back of the socket. So I've actually installed, um, I mean this is just a temporary cheap you know, okay, screw yeah, fix pump yeah, but we can yeah. replace that with a better one later. We've got some high pressure um, uh, pipe that goes all the way out and it goes down and it catches a sewage. We've got another sewage manhole there in the light well and it catches that. So this tees in and then it goes up and periscopes up outside so that if ever this does fill up, we're at risk of the whole thing flooding. So that's why we've got this kind of emergency yeah. potential. So emergency this is basically energy. swimming pool pipe, is it? The stuff that um, I, CPVC, whatever, solvent weld. Yeah. yeah, I can't remember. It's, it's not waste pipe. It's, it's not waste no, pipe. No, this oh is no, high. Yeah. So there's only one place yeah. that does this, a Scottish company. Well, I'm sure yeah. there's loads, but yeah, yeah. the place that I found was a Scottish company. Yeah. To be honest, you could do it with any old waste pipe, probably. Well, but. you probably couldn't, actually. I think that's spot on, you know, because... You know, people do try and get away with that yeah. kind of thing and then it blows apart. And what you want is these lovely brass non-return valves. They're the only things that really work well, in, in my experience. That, there's my periscope. It's, it's, <laughs> All right, it's so it comes out. Yeah, we're going nice. to We're gonna top and tail it properly so it'll look a bit nicer a little, later. A little warning saying, if yeah. the water's coming out of here, yeah. it's nice. Exactly, so we've got, um, this is what I call my roving pump, my roving emergency pump connection point, which ah. is when there's a flood, this is the manhole that goes to that manhole. It comes up here. I've got a uh, I've got a screw fix water pump in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know it's sewage, but yeah, yeah. 
it does the job fine. And when that fills up, it will start going back into the house. So we're pumping it out through that periscope as well. And then I've got my roving pump connection point if there's you know some other place I haven't thought of. Nice um, bit of staircase there, concrete. Yeah, so I'm sorry I can't show this in its gleaming, newly built glory. It's just got algae all over it. It's gonna need a pressure wash soon, but um, this is a suspended concrete staircase that we built, Anna and I built this one, almost single-handedly. I think we had Joe helping us at that time as well. It's got seven times 12 mil bars going up the way like that, and a minimum of six inches at the at this point at all times. Um, I've of seen concrete cover, of concrete, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, not of cover, so of concrete in total. Minimum yeah, cover of like yeah, 40 it. mil. Oh, okay. I've seen people on YouTube videos in various other countries uh, build things that with like that much. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure they work fine. The but Americans do it. They chuck the they chuck the rebar on the ground. Yeah. And then just pour yeah. the concrete on top of it, and that's the foundation. You One of the things that we were taught by um, by this expert who we who we kind of got like concrete consultancy from when you see it and when you understand it you can't unsee it because everywhere you go if there's a bridge if there's a building you see a bit of rebar spalling yeah and you just and you see the um yeah. the face of the concrete has broken off right. the rebar what's happened is water's got in there and it's made the bar rust, um, yeah. rust which expands and then breaks the concrete That's so it, that yeah. that compromises yeah. the structural integrity of the com concrete which is why rebar cover is so important yeah um, and also expansion gaps if, it's, if there's a movement joint and it yeah. gets, the water gets down the movement joint, yeah. you, you've got problems there. Before we got to this, you would put your finger in there and just black dust would come out. Oh, okay. It was really, really bad because this had been completely covered in um, cementious, like, you know, oh, in, yeah. probably in the 50s or 60s, someone yeah. had just thought, oh, you know, it's a bit wet, we'll just sh shove something on. Of course, that makes the problem worse because the brick then retains all that water. and the mortar is if eventually just kind of you know turns into out. dust yeah. so this is i'm very kind of proud to wipe my hands on here and nothing's coming off at all we went back um when you repoint a wall i learned from probably a great youtube channel such as yeah, uh, skill builder <laughs> you've got to go back 20 mil into yeah, your um yeah, okay. or minimum and a lot of people don't do that we really went back probably slightly more than 20 yeah. Um, and the it was reason just people don't do it is because it takes such a lot of material to fill it up again. Three tonnes of sand yeah. um, just for this one room, just for repointing this Goodness. one room. We've seen loads of repointed jobs where they've gone in four mil, you know, it's just oh, like it's not smudged, worth it. smudged It's just going to come over. out again, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The idea with this is, and again, this is a listed building, um, the council gave us permission to do these works, but they didn't know that we were going to do quite this level of yeah. care for the building. Yeah. Yeah, so this will be our bathroom. So we've got we're gonna have a double shower here. I built a bath seat because Anna said she she'd love to have a, a shower seat. Um, none of us could have a bath upstairs in our bath for about two weeks whilst I had these bits of wood sat in hot water. Oh, you were <laughs> bending them. Yeah. Oh. So um, so yeah, there's quite a cool kind of profile, a bent curve profile yeah, around here. It's beautiful. And I know that people make fiberglass ones. You know what? I just thought I know how to use wood, and this is what I like. Basically, you wouldn't put any truck in that no, no, if it's no. not covered. Even if you put some kind of paste over it, it's yeah. got to be fiberglass, yeah. really. So the idea with that is that you know you can sit down. It's got a little curve in the curve of your back here as well. Mm. To do it, I had to get a, a car jack and a bit of um, I think it was two by six and push this bit in. Um, this is actually in two sections, but I still had to push it in because it was such a, a tight curve. But you can see how many screws I've put in and it's been there for about, about a year. Pretty sure it's not going anywhere. And the benefit of my design here is that actually around the back of it, we're gonna have a little shoe storage. Um, four little doors and some lighting under there and have some shoe storage. There's a drip just here. Is This here is a drain. And I'll put a drain in, in, an internal drain, because otherwise it's just going to flood yeah. here. And it has done that actually over the last few weeks. So unfortunately, what you get when you have this amount of structural glass is, you know, you pay an incredible amount of money for an installed team to come along and um, spec this up. Nothing in this property is square. I mean, they never are, but this is particularly no. yeah. unsquare. Unfortunately, I know they didn't put any membrane between the that wooden upstand and the aluminium. From the outside, I've cleaned it all off yeah. and I've gunned some CT1 into it. And I think water is now not getting through between the two. I think it's getting through in the silicon join between the glass and the aluminium. I believe that it's got to come out. They, they, I think, will be disputing it. I've been trying to contact them for a number of months and only recently did they send a message saying, I'll call you tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't free 
on that day and I said so and they've not got back to me. I think we're into lawyer territory. Um, we get some kind of equivalent of flash band or whatever. There's some kind of product that this Italian guy who designed the, stru like the structural thing for the glass guys, he worked for them. He saw this thing at a trade show and it's this special tape which you can put on. And I said, yeah, but it's getting in the silicon. He said, well, if you lap it up, obviously it's gonna affect the aesthetics. Uh, lap it up to the glass. But I mean, come on, you spent 50 grand, including the doors, 50 yeah. grand. First of all, the gap between here and here, yeah. you need a bit of it just to go beyond the gap. So this needed to have overhung with a drip detail like yeah. that far below okay, it. Fine, and then that yeah. would solve the problem between there and there. Yeah. The silicon problem shouldn't be a problem. It's just silicon and silicon it properly. So there's no glazing gasket on this, it's just silicon. It's just silicon, yeah without maligning double glazing companies. I mean, they would expect to have an opening ready, yeah. a builder's opening ready to go, all sort of you know, flashing done and everything else. But if they then put their screws through the flashing, whose who's problem is that? You know, yeah. so if it's, oh, we've just done our bit, mate. They, they could say, oh, you needed to waterproof your opening before we come and put our yeah. aluminium on it. In which case, I don't mind somehow waterproofing between the two things. You could yeah, use a, a really good yeah, quality tape, yeah. but the problem that I've then got is that I believe, I'm pretty sure water is now getting in through that silicon and filling up the U-channel. There's two bits of evidence for that. One is that when it starts raining and you soak it full five minutes, nothing comes through. And then it starts coming through more and more and more quickly about here. And then you stop with the hose. And then for another five minutes after the water stopped dripping down, the water carries on coming through, so, so it's, I, it's being stored somewhere. It's in the channel, yeah. And it is in the channel. And when I say it's not coming through between the two, I mean you can you can put a bit of paper between the two and it comes out dry. So it's in the channel. That really is the installer's um, uh, job, is to make sure that the channel that they provide and the glass they put in their channel is waterproof. I looked at it and when I first saw this open drain in the roof, I thought, oh my gosh, what is this? You know, you can literally go in the loft, shove your hand in it and there's just water. Yeah. But you know what? You can keep it clean and yeah. you just get up there and you just get it clean and your pro any drips that have come into the building, you know, under that level, go. they just go yeah, because yeah. you can clean it. So I noticed, Matt, the top section of this isn't leaking. What's different about that? I'll tell you what's different. It's got overhangs. Ah. This stuff has got overhangs. So that's it. So these are your bifolds, yeah? Um, a company called High Fin. I think, I think that's the brand, although I'm yeah, not really yeah. sure. Um, they, they've got these kind of electric actuations ah. uh, they're lovely and all three go out i'm sorry that you're pointing yeah, your camera towards yeah, very dirty right. yeah, yeah but all three go out and they all three go wherever you want them so got it absolutely know, beautiful yeah, yeah. on a summer's day you can imagine these will be yeah. fantastic um very unfortunately water it's it's coming in under this screed well, that's where it's ending up and i know it's ending up with under the screen i can show you why but i believe that it's probably dripping down down the face of here into these channels it's got weep holes here these channels are made to take water you'd never seal that off no no exactly so you're accepting the fact that you're going to get water in them yeah unfortunately i noted that there i mean one of uh, another excellent skill builder video that i watched once was uh, where you install these frames yeah you have um, a membrane that goes underneath yeah and then it laps up onto the level of the screen so that any water that gets in it can't go further because it's literally you know, gravity will, yeah. will mean it just go it, it might pull there underneath but it'll eventually go go back out again there is no such membrane so what the guys did is they they did a bodge which they tried to do up there and it, it came off and this is this epdm stuff which they've yeah. silicon to the frame yeah that's just roof material that they've just got a strip of that yeah but i mean imagine if there's if this silicon joint just kind of goes anywhere then water's going to come in so we've got the wheat poles basically so we've got the wheat poles it's very difficult to know whether it's coming in through here or somehow kind of like building up under this membrane, which I really do plan to take off because I think it's as much use as a chocolate yeah. fire guard. Uh, but it's getting in under here. And I know it is because when I shove my little finger down this hole here, wet. it's wet. And then there's a hole in this screed, which was my services. Out of the bottom of that hole in the basement, if you look up, water's dripping out of that hole. So it's coming under the insulation. It's coming under the insulation, soaking, presumably pooling yeah. and soaking yeah. the whole lot yeah. and coming out of that hole. Um, and I've got an internal drain in my basement just to deal with that, which is, you know, horrible. There's a lot of complexities to this situation. So this brick wall was built after this was put in. Okay. And I had my qualms about it. And unfortunately, there's some L brackets, yeah. just some, you know, so some what, ties. So what's down, what's down here? What's, what, 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 yeah, sorry. so this is insulation. Yeah, on the outside. Yeah, so in this other words, is, it's external. Could, yeah. If you could dig down there, 
This is Could a, you this slide is... a membrane under the thing and what chip, under there? chip away a bit of the screw here? Or yeah, not? That's, that, that, is, that is possible. And so I've had to become an expert in concrete and I would class myself now not, an, not quite an expert because I'm not making money from it, but he said, Matt, you could, you, could, you could do work for other people and show them how it's done now. Yeah. I had to become an expert in lots of little different things, either by consultancy yeah. or... or so, you know. so to be clear, you'd rather have somebody in, get the job done, finish, get it out of your well, hair and be done with it. I'd but love you to. you just can't find anyone. We just can't find, we can't find people who we can trust who will care enough about the job as much as I do. And I don't, I recognise that we're going to be paying a bit more for that. Yeah. Um, we're not just going to get a, a gang of guys just coming in like getting it done. But I will, I would happily pay a little bit more for that. But I just want, I, I just want people who are able to see these quite difficult challenges and help us get through them. Um, and that's nigh on impossible to find because people want to own a job, don't they? You want to, well, yeah. it's like that guy's going and throw his hammer down. You know, you say, oh, the fall's going the wrong way, and he, yeah. he throws his hammer down. You know, yeah. you, you can't deal with people like that. Mm. No. Unfortunately, I mean, I hate to slag builders off because there's some great ones out there, but yeah. you, you, we get loads and loads of emails from people telling us the same story. I had these guys in, yeah. made a complete mess, yeah. they're not answering the phone, yeah. they're not interested, we've paid them. Yeah. And so it goes on. I love making things. I don't want to be thinking about no, legal no, recourse. No, no. I really enjoy solving takes, problems. It and takes it out of you. Fascinating to know what people think. Give us your suggestions on how Matt can overcome the problem on both bits of glass. I think the, the doors are slightly more straightforward and as we know we've got to get a membrane under there, yeah. push it through. But the, the window, it would be great to hear what people say about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure we're going to get people who are going to put in the comments below, either glazing job done, absolute nightmare, blah, blah, blah. So we get those as well. So you're not alone, but that doesn't make you feel any better. I've got to say your <laughs> wife or partner, whatever. Yeah, um, we got married two weeks ago. Oh, did you? Yeah. Well done, my <laughs> goodness. She's a keeper. She's uh, She's got involved in digging out sewage and yeah. doing everything. Been on the barren mixer. Goodness, mate. A whole lot. I wish you well, Matt. We'll see you again. We'll come back and see you. Lovely. Yeah? Thanks, Roger.